Let me try to briefly bring to your mind some conclusion on what we've done and heard these few days. We've been reminded that liberals and other non-Christians are not against doctrine. They're only against scriptural doctrine. We've been reminded that the church's fellowship has been ruptured because the church is not consistent. We, we have a difference between the church role and the regenerate church membership. Christ had 12 disciples with one unregenerate. We have 12 Christians with one regenerate. We've been reminded that the present evil age is sinking down upon us and that the loss of both catechism and catechismical instruction <laughs> too, too long a word, too many syllables and, and the loss of church discipline is directly related to our loss of Christian fellowship and our personal fellowship with God that we no longer have the tender affection for Christ and him being exalted and it has weakened us to the error of now we have been exhorted to live in the now because the world worships now. By worshiping now, it can ignore then and be unconcerned about tomorrow. By worshiping now, it has to deal with no doctrine but its own selfish desires and no consequences, including judgment. Let me recommend sometime the book of Hebrews. Paul faced much of the same problem with the Jerusalem church because of their persecutions and the suffering that they endured. That there were those in the church that were going back to Judaism because Christ hadn't come back yet. Maybe this wasn't right. So kindly and lovingly in Hebrews, he reminded these brothers of the superiority of Christ. He showed him superiority over angels over Moses, over the law, the great high priest. And in drawing conclusions on the great superiority of Christ, he encouraged them to have an active faith that developed a presence of holiness that demonstrated itself in a love and affection for Christ and those things that are Christ. You can't love Christ and not love Christ's church. You can't love Christ and not love Christ's people. He exhorted them to, to lay aside the entanglements and the sin and run with race, run the race with perseverance. Why? He said, consider Christ who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you might not grow weary and lose heart. When we look at this world, and if, and if no one did it for you, Jim Allop surely had to have helped you see that we may have won in our generation the Bible and lost God. When you look at the church, there's every reason for despair and little sign for any hope. But when you look at Christ, it's just the opposite. There's no reason for despair and every reason for hope. Throughout chapter 12, he reminds us that the holiness that God demands requires that he discipline us, that the discipline is a loving sign that we're his children. He, he encourages us to make holiness our ambition rather than ambition wholly consuming us. He reminds us that we do not have a Mount Sinai to touch, but we have a Mount Zion the holy city of God to move toward where the great assembly of the saints, those cloud of witnesses he previously referred to, and the angelic beings sit around, camped around the glory of God. He reminds us there is a great judgment coming when God will shake everything that can be shattered and leave the unshakable in its existence. And he draws this conclusion. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. 
Why? For our God is a consuming fire. So he is.